Well, inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. Oh, hello. Dan the Fishman here with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and welcome to my garden. You know, a lot of people ask me, Dan, what is the secret to a productive garden? And I've got to say that uh, at the top of my list has got to be soil quality or soil fertility. And if you dig around deep enough in my garden, you'll notice the occasional salmon bone. Why? Well, I uh, do tend to catch a lot of salmon. And I don't like to throw away the scraps. I compost them. And what I'm really doing is taking notes from nature. Because salmon are super, super important to the ecosystems of the Pacific Northwest. But when it comes to soil fertility, you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's science. Let it rain, let it pour, you gonna let it rain a whole lot more, yes, I got them deep river blue. Let the rain drive right on, you're gonna let those waves sweep along, cause I got them deep river blue. All right, for this lesson, we're gonna cover how to set up and conduct a scientific experiment on soil quality. First, we're going to cover some common items that you can find around the household and your neighborhood that you could use for this experiment. Second, we're going to cover the scientific method and apply it to this scientific experiment. And lastly, we're going to draw some connections between soil quality, food webs, and more specifically, fishery science. Let's do this. Okay. If we're going to be doing a scientific experiment involving plants, we got to put them in something. And not everybody's going to have access to these planters that you get at the store. No worries though, there's all kinds of containers you can use around the house. The main thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to have the same size, shape, color of your planters. Because if there are any differences, that could affect your results and we don't want that. More on that later. Okay. We're obviously gonna need some soil for this experiment on soil quality. So look around your property or your neighborhood and try to get a sample in a bucket or container like this. You don't need a lot. And then what you wanna do is you wanna mix it very thoroughly. After you've mixed your soil, you're gonna take one planter and you're gonna fill it up and that's gonna be your lower quality soil because what we wanna do is we wanna improve the remaining soil in here by adding fertilizer or compost. Now, if you don't have access to those things, you can make your own compost and it's not that difficult. So for example, if you look around and find some leaves, especially dried leaves, crush those up, add those in, mix that in. Same thing with uh, grass clippings. Fresh gra grass clippings have a lot of nitrogen in them. So adding those in there, used coffee grounds, make sure they're used, but used coffee grounds, used tea, those sorts of things are great compost and it's not gonna produce a lot of foul smells and stuff. So you're gonna mix that all together, add some water, stir it every other day, and after about a week or two, you should have some good compost for your experiment. And that's what you're gonna be filling the other container with. All right, the last item on our list of needs for this experiment would be the plants themselves. So ideally we would grow these plants from seed, but not everybody's gonna have access to seeds, so there are some other solutions to that. Uh, for example, if you walk around your neighborhood, odds are you can find some dandelion seeds, but it might not be the right time of year for that. Uh, so if you have trouble finding any sort of wild seeds uh, to grow from seed, then another option would be to try to find weeds and transplant them in your pots. Just make sure that they're the same species and about the same size. Then you're on your way to conducting this experiment. All right, we've got our materials covered. I'm sure many of you have an idea of what your scientific experiment is gonna look like. However, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. We wanna make sure we're following the scientific method. So I'm gonna review that real quick. Then I'm gonna revisit a couple of the components and add some additional detail that has to do with this experiment specifically. All right, so science starts with a question. Then you wanna do a little bit of research. Research a little bit about soil. Research a little bit about plants. What are their essential needs? Then we're gonna follow with a hypothesis or an educated guess. Then we're going to design and conduct your experiment. Experiment's the next step. Then we are going to uh, analyze the data or information that you've collected. And from that data, you analyze it and draw your conclusion. Did the data support your hypothesis? Did it not? Why so? Why not? 
And then lastly, we want to communicate that science. What good is science if you don't share your findings with uh, maybe your family or your friends? Um, so that's the basic scientific method right there. So when we're talking about this experiment specifically, there's a few things I want you to keep in mind. One is what kind of data are you going to be collecting? Now there's two broad categories of data. There is quantitative data and there's qualitative data. Now quantitative data has to do with quantities, things that you could count or measure. Qualitative data has to do with things that you could describe. So think about plants and how you could describe them and how, what kind of uh, descriptions you might want to gather that could help you draw your conclusions. All right, so another element of science that we need to take into close consideration when designing this experiment would be variables. Now variables are things that can change in an experiment or cause change in an experiment. So the variable that we're focusing on observing would be plant growth. We call that the dependent variable. And the variable that we are gonna be manipulating would be the soil type, and we call that the independent variable. But there are lots of other variables to consider and to what we call control. We want to control those variables. Think other things that influence plant growth. So you want to make a list of all the things that you can think of that influence plant growth and make sure that those are the same for each of your planters. That way, if you notice a difference in plant growth, you could be more confident in saying that, oh, it's got to be the soil type. Otherwise, if you don't control those variables, that could influence your results. And with that, you have all the information and resources you need to conduct this experiment at home. But it's gonna take some time, so it's a great opportunity to explore the importance of soil fertility out in nature. And to do that, I'm gonna give you a couple challenges. First, I'm gonna list a couple land animals or terrestrial animals, and I want you to find a link between them and the importance of soil fertility. One animal would be the black-capped chickadee. Another animal would be the gray wolf. Now once you press pause, do a little research, find those connections, then press play and we'll compare notes. So even though these are two very different animals, I'm sure you found a common pattern. The process is essentially working your way down the food web to the producers or plants and those plants requiring a certain level of soil fertility. So for the black-capped chickadee, that is an omnivore. It eats both plants and animals. Plants in the form of seeds and berries, uh, and for animals, oftentimes they would be insects. And those insects requiring plants in one way, shape, or form. For the gray wolf, uh, it feeds on a number of types of animals, very large down to very small. So examples would range from bison, deer, elk, moose, all the way down to rodents. All of those examples are of herbivores, animals that eat strictly plants. And those plants, of course, requiring soil fertility. But it's not just for food. Uh, the importance of soil fertility goes beyond that because all these animals, all the terrestrial animals, in one way, shape, or form require plants for habitat and shelter. Where is a deer gonna hide if there are no plants around? So no matter which way you look at it, any terrestrial animal is going to depend on plants in order to survive, and those plants are gonna depend on soil fertility. All right, so for the last challenge, we're gonna look at, this time, aquatic organisms, in this case, uh, one of the species of Pacific salmon, and the importance of soil fertility in a terrestrial or land environment. Um, and not only that, how also how the presence of salmon can benefit the soil fertility. So to help you out in your research, I want you to look up the term riparian zone. Maybe pair that search with salmon and that'll point you in the right direction. Another helpful hint is if you don't know already, look up what happens to Pacific salmon after they spawn or reproduce. And that could help you as well. Now go ahead and press pause, conduct your research, press play, and you can see how you did. So hopefully in your research you found that a riparian zone is an area of land that immediately borders a body of water, in this case, a river. Now, the plant community in riparian zones are critical for salmon survival. Uh, those plants provide shade in the summertime to help keep the water cold. Salmon really require cold water. Um, 
They provide habitat. Overhanging branches protect the salmon from predators. The branches that and logs that fall in the water provide additional cover. Plants can draw out excess water and prevent flooding and erosion. So those salmon require clear water. So that they help out in that front. And these plants can absorb pollutants. So they help keep the water clean. So having cold, clear, clean water and great habitat is critical for salmon. Now, what do salmon do for the soil quality in a riparian zone? Well, hopefully you found that after Pacific salmon spawn or reproduce, they die. And when they die, they decompose. And that provides great fertilizer for the soil in these riparian zones. It really increases soil fertility, which allows those plants to grow and thrive and in turn provide all those benefits for salmon. Oh, hello again. Welcome back. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I wish you success on your experiment and I hope you learned a few things about soil fertility, both at home and out in nature. So with that, this is Dan the Fishman signing out and I hope we get science again soon. My gal Sal, she's my pal and she looks just like a waterfowl and I got this deep river blue. Ain't no one to cry for me and the fish all go out on a spree when I got this deep river blue.